All right, good morning, folks. Welcome to the last set of lessons for grade 12 biology. We have three that we'll be doing today, um, one tomorrow, and then that will be the end of that chapter in terms of stuff I will assess you on. I'll still do population dynamics next week, uh, but there will be no actual formal assessment on it. So we start our final leg of this journey with the look at the nervous system. And when you think about everything that we've studied to date, in all of our lessons. It's, it, I find it quite humbling and, and fascinating that we end with the nervous system. It is the system I spent the most time studying in my undergraduate. So I will do my best to make as many connections to everything we've learned throughout the class because I do think it is incredibly fascinating. I do think it is incredibly important. And I think it is, uh, quite frankly, a marvel of, of biological evolution. So let's get started with the introduction to the nervous system and, and how it overall contributes to homeostasis because that has been the name of this unit and now we're going to start to look at the larger control systems that are responsible for uh, maintaining that homeostatic balance if you will so the nervous system will sense and respond to stimuli within the environment in an attempt to maintain homeostasis those optimal internal environments temperature ph pressure system what have you all concentrations all of those things are in some way, shape or form controlled by the nervous system. And, and the nervous system is very unique in terms of the set, uh, set of tools that those cells have at their disposal, as well as the way that they function. So the cell and cell structure of the nervous system is quite unique in that they are comprised of a couple of unique cells. So the neuron and the nerve are responsible for essentially making some of those decisions and ultimately detecting some of those stimulus. So they're a very specialized cell, incredibly specialized cell with cytoplasm and cell membrane. Um, but as you can see, they have that long tail, which is called an axon. And that axon has terminal endings that we'll use for communication to other neurons. And they communicate that information through those dendrites. And then those dendrites contact with the cell body, the nucleus, and then that process repeats throughout. So a nerve essentially is comprised of many of these things called axons and these axons are going to be responsible for essentially sending that signal downstream if you will and I'll, I'll talk more about that as we move through so again like i mentioned with regards to those dendrites and with regards to axons they are responsible for communication so dendrites are an extension of the cytoplasm and they form the cell body which is responsible for receiving signals in to that neuron or into that nerve. So there's, as you can see in that picture, it, there's hundreds of thousands of sometimes even millions of dendrites that come out from that cell body that are responsible for receiving signals from other neurons or other nerves. And as I alluded to that axon, which, which differentiates is one of the differentiating factors between other cells. It's this long extension of cytoplasm from the cell body and they have these axon terminals at the end, which transmit a signal after, um, after they kind of propagate it a little. And I'll talk about how signals are, are received and sent as we move through the, the concept of this. But it's, it's fascinating to think about the adaptive process that had to go on in order to allow for these types of cells to evolve. And um, I really, I hope we don't really cover too much of this, but I hope in your biological studies, when you do come across uh, nerves and neurons and, and their evolution and their development and how they actually work and function, you, you remember learning about them uh, in this class fondly. So neurons don't just function on their own. They have many support cells that are responsible for kind of helping them out. Uh, the neurons are the star player of the team, if you will, the Kawhi Leonard's and the glial cells and all of the other neuron support cells are the, uh, the teammates that Without them, there there's not going to be as good, but they're not the big star of the show, so to speak. So, uh, glial cells are non-neuron cells that do not conduct electrical signals, but they definitely need to help provide neurons with that nutrients and support. They think of them as like a connective tissue for neurons. They're responsible for ensuring that those neurons get as much of the energy that they need. They help with structural support and keeping them propped up essentially. They help keep them uh, from tearing and breaking because they can be quite long and, and they're very important to this process. 
So one example of a glial cell is something called a Schwann cell. Uh, so this Schwann cell forms a tightly wrapped layer of cell membranes to the axon, and it's going to, oops, and it's going to insulate that axon and prevent a loss of signal. When we talk about signal propagation uh, moving forward with regards to neurons, these Schwann cells are going to help insulate and prevent that loss of signal over time. These gaps uh, between those Schwann cells that are exposed uh, to extracellular fluid and are not insulated, these nodes are, are called nodes of Ranvier, and they help speed up the movement of electrical impulses. And again, when we think about how neurons send signals downstream, and when we look at that a little bit later on, you'll start to see that these nodes of Ranvier in conjunction with these Schwann cells really help to speed up that movement of electrical impulses. And it's going to allow ions to move in and out of that axon freely. And it kind of creates like a little bumper cart uh, system, if you will. And I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll talk about that more later. So when we think about the organization of the human nervous system and, and really any nervous system of any highly evolved mammal, uh, it's broken down into two different parts. The first part is the central nervous system. That central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, it's going to receive and communicate information with that periphery system, okay? That periphery system or that peripheral nervous system is going to contain all of their nerves that are not directly uh, associated to the brain or spinal cord. They definitely connect to them, but they're not the actual brain or spinal cord. And then we, we break these two different nerves up into afferent and efferent, which I will go into a little bit of detail, but we don't really spend too much time talking about the difference between those two. So the two different organizations of the human nervous system have to communicate with each other in order to become a functional homeostatic maintaining unit. Because when you really think down to the core of things, the brain is just like anything and everything we do in life is, is in an attempt to maintain homeostasis, right? We, we eat to maintain blood sugar homeostasis. Uh, we excrete waste to maintain blood concentration and, and, and um, water, con like water amounts homeostasis. We put on clothes or, uh, you know, turn on air conditioning to, again, maintain that temperature homeostasis. And, and all of those functions that the brain control, it's all in an attempt to maintain homeostasis. So we are technically walking and talking uh, homeostasis machines, if you will. So it's really interesting to think about how those two things work. When we look at some of the specific details, uh, I'll make those connections moving forward. So let's talk about those afferent and efferent systems in a little bit of detail. Uh, when we think about that peripheral nervous system that gets broken up, when we talk about afferent system, it's going to receive sensory info, okay? It's receiving sensory info, and it's going to communicate with that central nervous system. It's saying, hey, it's hot out. Hey, it's cold out. Hey, we're hungry. Hey, it's thirsty. Anything that receives sensory info and communicates it with the central nervous system is called the afferent system. The afferent system. The efferent system, as you guessed it, is going to send signals to the periphery. It's going to send signals to the periphery nervous system, and it's always going to be in a response to a stimuli. Okay, the, the classical example that I like to use is uh, if you're ever cooking something or if forget even cooking something, if you're ever eating something and you go to pick up that, um, my favorite food is French fries because it is the perfect food. It's potato, it's fried, what more do you need? Uh, when you go to pick up a French fry and it's too hot, right? Really and truly the afferent system is saying, whoa, that French fry is smoking hot. Hey, central nervous system, it's hot. The central nervous system will go, huh, that's probably bad for us. We should put it down. Hey, efferent system. Yes, brain? Can you put down that French fry? It's, it's too hot right now. Okay. And then the efferent system will send that signal out to the, essentially the periphery nervous system, and it will release the French fry essentially. So how those two systems work in conjuncture, it's not a money example, um, but my hope is that a food example is just as good, if not maybe even better. So when we think about those two parts in general, um, it's very important that we consider the somatic and the autonomic systems because we haven't really talked about those ideas yet with regards to the efferent system because the efferent system has broken down into two parts, the somatic and the 
autonomic system. The somatic is under voluntary control. You have control of the somatic system. You can make that decision to drop something if it is um, something you don't want to hold. But just like in my example above, um, you don't actively think about dropping something that's too hot. Your autonomic system, which is involuntary control, it just responds. It's too hot, I'm going to drop that. And then we can further break down that autonomic system into two more components, the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. So let's take a look at that. So when we think about the breakdown of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system, which is something I'm hopeful that some of you have heard of before, the autonomic system, which we have zero control over, is, is going to start to look at some of the aspects of homeostasis that we're going to focus on, for, that we have been focusing on for this entire unit. So that autonomic system is going to be comprised of sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic is going to dominate in times of danger and stress. Okay, It's going to increase uh, the force and rate of those processes, and it will increase heart rate, increase breathing rate, increase blood pressure. It's that fight or flight system that we've, you, I'm sure some of you, if not all of you have heard about in some capacity, it's going to really take control in times of danger or stress. It is not an evolutionary leftover because there are many people, unfortunately, that still experience uh, times of danger and stress, but ultimately it is the body system that's responsible for increasing that heart rate, breathing rate, and blood pressure. When someone scares you, right? Normally this is where in class I would like jump up and make a loud noise and bang on something to scare people to remind them that, okay, now what's happening in your body? You're feeling stressed. You're feeling in danger. Your heart rate is increasing. Your breathing rate's increasing. If we had BP cuffs, we could take blood pressure and you would see your blood pressure is increasing. So all of those things uh, are going to be controlled by that sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic system is going to dominate and take control of those low stress situations during rest. Rest and digest is the uh, normal analogy that gets connected to the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, it's going to reduce the effects of the sympathetic nervous system, and it's going to be responsible for the maintenance processes that go on in your body. So we're talking about growth of tissue, repair, digestion, which is the big one that uh, we talk a little bit about. And that's so important to everything we've learned about in terms of homeostasis and metabolic processes in general. That parasympathetic system is when you are sitting comfortably after a meal and you're like, whew, not a care in the world. I'm a little bit snoozy. I could take a nap if I really wanted to, but my body is responsible for relaxing all those other processes, maintaining all of those other cells and cell structures, growing and repairing and digesting. Okay. Now, both are always going on. All right. That's an important thing to think about, right? It's not that one happens and the other doesn't. Okay. But they, one will always dominate over the other in some way, shape or form. So when you think about doing any type of fitness, it's not actual danger or stress, but you're stressing the, the systems within your body. So if you go for a run, the sympathetic system will, will be the one that's in charge, so to speak. That doesn't mean the parasympathetic system is like, okay, so long. See you later, suckers. I'm doing nothing. It's still doing some of those processes. It's just it's not as uh, prolific. It doesn't do it as much or use as many resources to do that. So it's important to recognize that one will dominate in certain circumstances over the other, but it doesn't mean that they're not happening both at the same time. Oops. Okay, so that's the, the breakdown of the peripheral nervous system. Well, you'll look at the central nervous system a little bit later today in this period when you do your activity, but... We'll cross that bridge when we get there. So the last thing I want to talk about with regards to the uh, intro to the nervous system is the idea of neural signaling. Uh, the communication between neurons is something that we, we kind of get into a little bit of detail in here, but I, we really, unfortunately, we don't have the time to go into the specific details of how neurons communicate with each other en masse. Um, it would be fun, but the reality of it is, is we basically have like one day left of, of content that I can assess you on. So... I want to try to use that time wisely to make you sh make sure you have enough time to work on some stuff. So the central nervous system uh, and its integration in general looks at the signaling between neurons to determine what to do. This is a hypersimplified, maybe even oversimplified uh, concept because it's not quite how it actually works. But for the circumstances that you are all learning 
Uh, it's important to realize that, I think, so that's why I share it with you. So uh, starting at the left here, boop, we have our stimulus. And that could be external, it could be internal. It could be something from outside, it could be the sun rising, it could be uh, the sight of a lion, or it could be internal. Uh, a, a large amount of glucose is released, for example, as a result of digestion. Some type of sensory receptor of that afferent neuron, which is regardless of its external or internal, it will detect that stimulus. It will say, hey, okay, I've detected that stimulus. Oops, I've detected that stimulus via the afferent sensory neuron. I'm gonna send this message and send this signal along that neuron. And then you get to a process called the interneurons that are kind of responsible for pinging signals back and forth. And these neural messages are basically sorted and interpreted by that central nervous system. Remember we talked about the brain being the kind of the big fella in all of this. That central nervous system, I'll use a different color for this. Uh, let's go purple, I don't use purple enough. The central nervous system in those interneurons will integrate that message and it will go, huh, interesting, interesting. Uh, it appears that there's a lion over there and it's moving towards us. What does this mean? How is this important? Why do we need to be worried about this? Because I feel like we need to be worried about this is essentially what those interneurons do. Uh, they do it at the speed of light, which is, I think, quite fascinating, but it takes a bit of time. Okay, it takes a bit of time for these neural messages to kind of sort and be interpreted. And when I say it takes a bit of time, we're talking like microseconds or seconds, right? Because um, really and truly, if you evolve to look at a line and to think for about 10 minutes and go, huh, I wonder how I should react to this. Uh, chances are your ancestors would have been kaput. So uh, interneurons, they kind of ping those messages back and forth. They then transmit that message along the neuron to those efferent neurons. And those efferent neurons are going to affect a response. So that neural message that was pinged around in those interneurons for however undetermined amount of time, it will pass it on to the efferent neurons, which will affect a response, which as you can recall back from when we learned about effectors in the initial homeostasis components, it will impact those effectors to do something. It will cause those capillaries to dilate. It will cause those glands to release sweat. It will cause the, um, the insulin to be released. So all of those things that were told by those neural messages and uh, through the efferent neurons will actually have an effect and an action ultimately being the complete return to system normal in some way, shape or form. If that system normal is to run and get the heck out of there so you can live to fight another day, then that's what it is. But most of the time we're talking about re increasing or decreasing blood sugar levels or uh, decreasing or increasing temperature. Those return to norms um, are kind of like that key component here. And again, this is the entirety of that process in general, when you think about start to finish, how the nervous system processes or receives, processes, and then acts and affects upon the world. Okay, sweet. So that is the end of this lesson. I'm gonna stop recording here and answer questions. And then I'll talk a little bit about what's next for you all in terms of the next lesson, because uh, those of you who have kind of opened up the files ahead, you'll see that it's a bit of a self-directed thing. And again, I really wanted to build that time in for you all now to use it to, to work on that note. Or if you feel like you need to work on the assignment or the culminating or just review some of the concepts that will be on the quiz tomorrow, I'm giving you that option in that time. It should still be done at some point in time. And I will be ha happy to answer questions uh, throughout this period on it. But really, I can't stress that now is the time to manage your time. Okay, folks.